So uh, here you have an image of the Human Genome Project, right? How many people here have heard of the Human Genome Project? Everybody, right? It's the beginning thing at the, at the beginning of the 21st century. It was thought of in the 1990s. We thought it was going to take $2.5 billion to do. It was done about three years early. I'm here to talk about what I think of as the next big step in the interaction between biotechnology and genomics and the planet Earth, which we call the Global Genome Initiative. Now, why is this an appropriate thing to think of now? Because this represents a revolution in our ability to understand life on Earth and understand the interaction between human biology, between human medicine, between uh, agriculture, between uh, the things we just heard about, nanotechnology, between the way we imagine how we interact with life on Earth. Obviously, as, as the world goes on, we see that humans are taking more and more resources from the planet in order to reduce our impact on the planet, yet still maintain levels of human welfare, we need to make this uh, interaction between us and the planet Earth uh, much more efficient. In order to do that, we need to learn from nature. The Global Genome Initiative is about uh, tremendously increasing the rate at which we can learn from that uh, point. Point it at the... Yeah, so here's a picture of of life on Earth, everything from emus to snakes to plants to diatoms to seals in the upper corner. What does this represent? The world is a very diverse place. I'm an evolutionary biologist. I'm 60 years old. I have been places, I have seen things none of you will ever be able to see again. I have held in my hands species that have gone extinct. The reason we need to preserve the genomes of life on Earth is because each one of those genomes has the potential to have a secret. For example, in the talk that Dr. Harala just gave, what is it that enables us to imagine what nanotechnology can do? It's, it's the secrets of what nature is already doing. We are now losing uh, species on Earth at roughly to 100, 100 to 1,000 times the background rate. We need to get all of the diversity that you see here uh, preserved, I call it life on ice, so that we basically have plan B as we look forward to the 21st century so that we can uh, learn from nature. So uh, what's this? This is just to show you where we started out. On the one hand, you see an image from Charles Darwin's journals in 1837. Darwin is just beginning to figure out what it means to figure out the relationship between different forms of life on Earth. This is such a famous diagram that graduate students in physical anthropology are having it tattooed on their body as an icon of scientific knowledge. On the right, you see what's become of the science of inferring phylogenetic, that is to say genealogical relationships between life on Earth, between organisms. This is some work we did on spiders. We now have the ability to see where we are in the history of life on Earth. You see, you're just in the upper uh, left-hand corner. This is a tree involving only 3,000 kinds of life on Earth. The largest tree produced so, so far is up to 76,000 kinds of life on Earth. This is a map to tell us how to sample the genome of life on Earth to preserve the information in those genomes so that we can basically improve the welfare of the human race. Um, now, why is this important? As I said, for one thing, it's important because we're losing species. For the Tasmanian wolf in the upper corner, it's too late. For uh, the tiger, it's actually also too late in the wild. Tigers require so much space to maintain breeding populations that in any of the places to which tigers are native now, there is simply not enough natural space left to have a self-sustaining uh, population of tigers, unless, of course, we do some sort of revolution politically to enable that to happen, but they need hundreds of thousands of square kilometers. The genome of the tiger, however, is something that we can keep forever. Uh, we're also having impacts, as I said, in water, in, in climate change. For all of these reasons, uh, 
It would be unwise to put all of our eggs, as it were, in one basket, betting that conservation is going to be able to preserve the full spectrum of diversity on Earth as the centuries go by. Instead, we should, we should focus also on sort of plan B, a backup plan where we have specimens in museums with genome quality tissues so that we can, we can constantly go back to that library to explore what they contain. Now, Museums, of course, have been around for hundreds of years. I work at one of the oldest museums, one of the largest uh, natural history museums on Earth, the National Museum of Natural History at the Smithsonian Institution. We are not, by, this is not just a Smithsonian project. This is an image or an imagination for uh, a consortium of museums all across the world because we also now have the biotechnology, we also have the bioinformatics to be able to unite all the collections of all the institutions around the world in one global interoperable database, telling any scientist on Earth, any conservationist on Earth, what's where and what they can do with it. Uh, just to show you that this, uh, on the side you see uh, sort of classical co collections. This is the Smithsonian thinks it has about 126 million separate objects. We store them in classical containers, like that jar with tubes of alcohol. We've just built a biorepository with about 70 freezers and about 60 uh, liquid nitrogen tanks, which I'll show you in a second. Those, that's capable of holding about 3 million different genome quality tissues. So museums then need to transform themselves from a 19th and 20th century pattern into a 21st century pattern, where they become, as they've always been, the libraries of diversity for the kinds of science that are going to be necessary in the 21st century. So, uh, what does that actually mean? Here you see a tank, that's a liquid nitrogen tank. On the side you see uh, a gravity-fed container of about 3,000 liters of liquid nitrogen. These are large biorepositories. You cannot build one of these in every single university. These need to be regionally distributed uh, regional centers of collections of tissues and DNA and all of the, uh, you know, the background or the, the basic voucher material for any sort of genomic science. So, what you can do with these things then is build about three, to, this one alone, and it's the largest biorepository in the natural history world. In the medical world, that we have biorepositories that are this size, but in the science world, they're really rather rare. This one's will be able to contain somewhere between three and four million slots. There's only 1.9 million species described on Earth to date. So this already has... Now, of course, that's a, a fraction of what's actually out there, but it's just to show you that the development of biotechnology, the development of genomic science, renders an understanding of the secrets and the design, just the imagination, the natural imagination contained in the genome of life on Earth is now a very feasible thing to capture. So, why would you say this is possibly true? It's because of this one particular thing that I'm going to tell you about now, and that's the power of phylogenetic thinking. The relationships among organisms, the genealogy of organisms, is actually the most powerful explanatory uh, theory in all of biology. If I tell you that I pick up, you know, a funny looking critter and I say, well, you know what, I think that's a mosquito or I think it's a fly. That, knowing it's a fly, tells me hundreds and thousands of things about it. I, I know it has two wings, I know it has six legs, I know how it reproduces, I know what it eats. The, the fact that you know how things are related is the best way to predict the unknown. You can take a, a no, an unknown, if you know where it fits in the tree, you can automatically predict most of its qualities. It turns out that all of life on Earth, as you see from this table, fits, for example, in just 8,000 families. A family is a taxonomic rank. So their species are the first thing, those are grouped into genera, genera are grouped into families. There are only 8,000 families of life on Earth. That's a very small number. When we think about, you know, terabytes of data or six billion people on Earth, 8,000 families, right? That's it. Now, there's 15 million species, maybe. There are probably a lot more than that. We're not going to be able to preserve genome quality tissues, at least thinking in the terms of the early 20th century, of each one of those species. But we could do every genus, for example. As a, that would be roughly the equivalent of sampling every tenth species of life on Earth. 
I think there are about 175,000 genera on Earth. As you see on the bottom figure, even without organizing science in order to do this in any kind of disciplined way, about 80% of all the families of life on Earth are actually already uh, have been, had some work done on them genetically. About 40% of all the genera. That means that somebody somewhere went out in the woods, got one of each one of those families, brought it back, and did some kind of sequence work on it. That's without even trying. Therefore, I think getting all of life on Earth on ice is probably a very feasible plan to have. So, just to give you one idea of, of how easy that would be, take a group like ants. Ants are the dominant uh, herbivores in the tropics. Uh, as E.O. Wilson has said, they basically run the earth. There's about 20,000 species of ants known, but there's only uh, 290 genera of ants, right? And of those, again, without any significant real amount of funding, just the sort of money that a single investigator can get over approximately the last five or 10 years, we alone, as one institution, have all 240 genera, which is about 80% of all the ants on life on Earth. So I'm, not only is this feasible, it's actually fairly simple to do and fairly cheap. So uh, why then, um, where would we do this? You'd do it in all the places all around the Earth. For example, the, on another sort of angle that the Smithsonian is working on, we're, we're coordinating an international network of what we call global uh, Earth observatories. These are areas that are 50 hectares in size in which uh, scientists measure the diameter of every tree above one centimeter at, at breast height. Right? So there, there's, this was started in Panama in about 20 or 25 years ago. The research model has spread all around the globe now so that there's approximately 45 of these sites. And within those sites, those are basically pristine pieces of forest, you also have all the other forms of life that live in forests. So you have the predators, you have the herbivores, you have the insects, you have the fungi, you have the bacteria, the birds, the mammals, the snakes, all of that stuff. If we were simply to archive the genomes of everything that occurred in those sites, I think we would probably get about half of all the genera uh, on, that is on land uh, already. So not only do we have the technology to store this, not only do we have the genomics to understand all the secrets in the genomes, we also have uh, basically a, a good enough understanding of the biogeography of life, of where different forms of life live on Earth so that we can go out and do this in a relatively short amount of time. So, uh, the point of this though, let me just tell you a few stories about why this is important. Something like, say, take the, the genus Bothrops, which is that snake I had on the first slide. That snake, uh, what, what do snakes want to do when they bite you? They want, basically, they want heavy duty blood flow. So, they, they actually have invented particular small peptides that increase blood flow in their victims, right? That snake, became the, the venom from that, that genus of snakes became the basis for a whole class of drugs that deal with high blood pressure. Because if you can expand the blood vessels, relax them, your blood pressure goes down. To give you another example, something that no one knew for uh, until probably about 10 years ago, there's a genus of snails called cone snails. There's about 70 species of these snails. Each one of these snails makes about 100 to 200 toxic compounds. Now, when you say toxin, you may think, well, I'm talking about uh, poisons, right? But all drugs at, at high enough doses are poisons. Conversely, all toxins at low enough doses are probably interesting drugs. So th these things, for example, make toxins that are, are basically function as painkillers. They're 200 times more powerful than morphine, and they show when you inject them into mice and other kinds of animal models, the mice show no signs of dependency. This, this kind of discovery of completely unknown uh, mechanisms, unknown solutions to human problems is found throughout the genome of life. And you may say that, well, you know, the, it, what actually happened with the snakes was the snake had bad side effects, but once the the scientist understood the trick that the snake was using in its venom, 
then through a series of modifications of the molecule, they were able to reduce the side effect and produce a whole new class of drugs. There are many examples of this from genomes on Earth, for example, in phase one and phase two trials against cancer, where the, the organism is making a molecule that uses a, a, a mode of action which scientists have never thought about. They never even knew you could do it. So that's why preserving the genome of life on Earth is so important. It's because of the secrets of the, the kinds of technological solutions that nature has already evolved over the past 400 million years. That's why it's important. Now, in summary then, the point of this is to unite sort of four or five large revolutions that have already occurred. One is the revolution in genomic sciences, so that you can sequence and, and rapidly target and understand what an organism is doing with its genome. The biotechnology, which, which makes the, you know, the doing of all that possible. In other words, the technology that underlines the science. The biorepositories, the fact that you can build these buildings and preserve life on Earth. Now, there's a political aspect to this as well, and it's not just political, it's that we also have tremendous disparities. So the other thing I think is particularly important is that we also have what amounts to being revolutions in diplomatic relations between countries. We have biodiverse rich countries and biodiverse poor countries. We're, we, you know, Slovenia, the United States is relatively poor, but we have the technology. The thing that changes all this is the Convention on Biological Diversity. And legally, we also have something, it's difficult like any political revolution, but we have the ability now to perhaps to preserve tissues in, in uh, countries, in tropical countries, or to borrow those tissues and have them on perfectly enforceable legal frameworks so that even though this tissue belongs, say, to India, it could remain somewhere else. In other words, we should have no obstacles to the non-commercial use of of the kinds of secrets that I'm talking about. And as we should be able to do this fully in the, con in the context of the Convention on Biological Diversity. So what does success look like in five years? First of all, we need a consortium of institutions around the world that are committed using bioinformatics to produce an interoperable global database and museum of genome quality tissues that represent the diversity of all of life on Earth. That's one. Second. We need to have, I think, about, we ought to be able to get probably 75% of the genera of life on Earth in the next five years. In other words, one of the things you need is you need to have the organism that the, uh, that the genome came from. So, for example, for the cow genome, they don't actually have the cow. They've got the genome, but they don't know which cow it came from. In this kind of stuff, you need to have the organism that it came from as well. So, I think in five years is a, is a perfectly feasible thing to do, and it's called the uh, global genome. Thank you.